Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem unique paths Two. we have solved the first variation of this problem. This one is pretty similar. We're given an M by N grid. So this is our grid down here. We are going to start at the top left position where this robot is. I don't really pay too much attention to the entire story. We can either move down or to the right. And anytime we get to a different position, it's the same. We can either go down or or to the right, but we can only move along positions that are marked with a zero. So any of these free positions are gonna be marked with zeros, but this here is an obstacle and that's going to be marked with the value one. And that means we are not allowed to place our robot here. We can't go through this position. So it's like blocked off. Now our goal is to get to the bottom right position. That's our target position. And what we're looking to do is just count the total number of ways that we can reach that position. So just taking a look at this grid, how many ways are there? Well, we can go to the right and then down. That's one path and we can go this way. So there's really only two paths in this grid. But if we had a larger grid, we could have more unique paths that lead to the target. Well, depending on how many obstacles we have as well. If there wasn't an obstacle in this position, we would have a lot more. We would be able to reach the target position this way or reach the target position this way or this way or this way or even this way and this way as well. So the easiest way to solve this problem is brute force. And using this logic, we can come up with the more optimal solution, which is going to involve dynamic programming, but it's not too crazy. Taking a look at the brute force solution, it's best to handle this recursively. So we would do it with a depth first search. The main thing we'd wanna pass in is our row and column, cause we're here, we have two choices no matter where we are, we can either go down, which is to take our row and increment it by one or to move to the right, which is to take our column and increment it by one. And then recursively, what we want to ask ourselves is to count the number of unique paths starting from here. What we can do is just count the number of unique paths from here and the number of unique paths from here and then take those and then add them up and then we will have the total number of unique paths from here. But then the catch is, how do we compute the ones from here? Well, recursively, we'd pretty much do the same thing. Go down, count the paths from here, or go to the right and count the paths from here. And basically, that's how our recursion would work. We could imagine like a decision tree, but the base case is going to be when we either, suppose from here we go out of bounds too far down, or maybe from here, we go too far to the right. That's a base case, and that would return zero. There's zero paths if we go out of bounds. The other base case is if we actually reach the target position, then we'd say one. So from here, how many ways can we reach the target position? One. What about from here? How many ways can we reach the target position? One. So a good way to like initialize this would be to like place a one here, or at least imagine that there is a one here and then our math kind of works out for all the rest of the positions. And the good thing about this is that while recursively, this would be an exponential solution, but when we implement caching to this, caching as in any time we compute the value that goes in any of these positions, we never want to recompute it because for maybe this, it's pretty simple. We just look down and then we can get the value here. But for somewhere like this, there might be multiple paths and we don't want to have to retraverse those paths recursively. So we do caching to eliminate repeated work. So we'll have like a two dimensional DP grid. That's the same size as this. I usually use a hash map, but it's up to you. This will though lower our time complexity instead of being exponential will just be the size of the grid which is n times m that's also the amount of memory we're going to need for this dp solution so let me quickly show you the recursive solution but there's actually a way to optimize the memory to get this to actually be big o of n or you could get it down to big o of m but basically like one of these rows is the memory that we need and that's like the true dynamic programming solution so i'll show you that afterwards so this is the recursive solution. I'll go through it pretty quickly. The first thing I like to do is just get the dimensions of the grid. So M is the number of rows, N is the number of columns. And then I'm using a hash map to use as our cache. So what I did is exactly what I said in the drawing explanation. I'm basically initializing the bottom right position to be one because we know that's kind of our base case. 
but this wouldn't necessarily be required. And you could have instead used like a two dimensional grid that's n by n, but I just like to use a hash map for recursive problems. We're passing in the row and column into our recursive function because this function is defined in the outer function. We already have a reference to our DP cache and to these variables as well, so I'm not passing them in. And there's a few base cases here. One is if we go out of bounds. So if our row becomes equal to M or our column becomes equal to N, then we wanna return zero immediately. The third case is that the grid position is blocked. We know if this value is a one, then it's blocked. We can't traverse through there. So we would return zero in that case. That's the number of unique paths. The other case is that we've already computed the value at this position. So this is already in our cache. This key is in our DP hash map so we would return the value that was already stored there now if that's not the case that's where we actually do our recursion here so counting the paths at row plus one counting the paths at column plus one adding them together storing them in the hash map and then returning that value and then finally to get our result we just call dfs starting at the top left so now to actually understand the true dynamic programming solution, which can be really helpful for more difficult problems, I would say this is one of the more easy two-dimensional dynamic programming problems. So it's a good example to practice on. So let's talk about the real dynamic programming solution and let's consider this same example over here. Even though it's a pretty simplified one, it will still get us all the information we need. Even our caching solution is basically computing all the values that go inside of this grid to eventually get us the value at the top left of the grid. So the idea behind dynamic programming is that we can compute these values bottom up Instead of doing them recursively, instead of trying to compute this one first and then that leads to the subproblems, we can immediately start with the subproblems and then compute them in such an order that we can eventually arrive at the ultimate solution. So that's exactly what we do. We start at the bottom right and then fill these values in in reverse order to get us the top left value. But some people do it the opposite way. Some people don't like to traverse arrays in reverse order and then the rows in reverse order as well. The interesting thing about this problem is that it's symmetrical in that if you count the number of paths starting from here, to the bottom right, that's the exact same as counting the paths from the bottom right up to the top left. So you can do it the same way that you want to. You can do from top right to left, or you can do like bottom up like I'm doing. It's up to you. I prefer to do it bottom up because that kind of preserves like the context of the problem because in the context of the problem, we're allowed to go down and to the right. So if we kind of do it the opposite way, we'd have to consider us going either to the left or above, but that's a pretty small point. Now to actually start filling in the values, we know that the bottom right is always gonna be a value one. So we can just initialize it like that. And let's just mark this spot just to indicate that we have an obstacle here, but we still need to fill the value in. Going in reverse order, so what value would we put here? Well, we wanna add the value to the bottom and the value to the right. And when we go out of bounds here, we can just assume that the value is zero as like the default value. So then the value we'd put here is one. What about over here? Same thing, go to the uh, bottom and to the right. So we put a one here. What about over here? Same thing, we go bottom, that's a one. When we go out of bounds to the right, we also assume there's a zero here. So we just put a one over here. And then here, when we get to the obstacle, we just wanna skip it. So we just either leave a zero here or put a zero if there's not already one. And we just keep going like that. So from here, we'd get a one and here we'd have a one. And then finally at the top left position, we'd look down, look to the right, add those together. We'd get a two. That's the result that we're looking for. So it's really that simple, but the way we coded this up, we have the entire grid in memory, but it's actually not required. We don't need to have this N by M grid in memory because if you notice something, every time we look for a value, suppose this one, what we would do is look to the bottom and look to the right. Anytime we're computing a position, we only need the previous row in memory. By the time we get up here and we're trying to fill these values in, we don't really need this row in memory anymore. We just need the previous row. Then you think, well, we only need at most two rows in memory. But actually, we need even less than that. We only need one row in memory. Let me show you what I would do. We have these values here. I'm gonna show you how to fill these values in if we were doing it in place. So how would we get the value here? Well, we'd look bottom, the value that's already stored here, and look 
to the right. So it's one plus zero. So then we'd put a one here. But what I'm gonna do is actually place it over here because my argument is that once we compute the value here, we actually don't need this value to even be in memory. So let's just assume that this value actually is taking up this spot, but I'm just illustrating to you that this doesn't matter anymore. We're never gonna use it again. We only need these three values, basically the size of the row. And now to get the value here, well, it's an obstacle, so it doesn't matter anyway. So we'd put a zero here. Once we put that zero here, we would never need this value anyway. And then finally, when we get to this position, we want to look to the bottom because we wanna know how many paths we can get going down. And we wanna to look to the right because we wanna know how many paths we can get going from the right. But in reality, these values are still gonna be stored in this position. We're not gonna allocate extra memory for them. So one plus zero is gonna give us a one here. So as you can see, it's possible to fill a row in in place without allocating extra memory. So we just need a single row in memory, and that's the idea I'm gonna use to solve this problem. And I'm gonna do it in reverse order, but you don't necessarily have to. So what I'm gonna do is just initialize the dimensions again. This time I'm gonna have a DP row, which is gonna be filled with zeros. It's gonna be the size of any of these rows. And the last value is gonna be set to one, kind of like I did in the drawing. And that will get us to the most optimal solution. So what I'm gonna do is then go through the list of rows in reverse order. So we have M rows and I'm going to go through them in reversed order. So R is gonna be the index of the row and I'm gonna go through every column in reversed order. So we can do that just like this. And there's gonna be a couple cases. We know the really simple case is if the value in the grid is a one, then we know it is blocked off. So we can't go anywhere, we can't do anything. So what we are gonna do at that point is just say DP at this position, at this column is going to be equal to zero. And then we have a couple cases. And then otherwise what we would do is say, dp at this column is going to be equal to the value below it. What's the value below it? It's just gonna be at dp of column because we're doing this in place, remember? To get the value in the previous row, what we would do is just get the same value in this dp row at the same index. So this is the bottom value. And to get the value to the right, we say add dp at column plus one. So that's how we would get the value. Remember the couple edge cases where we go out of bounds. If we go out of bounds going to the bottom, well, in this case, that's never going to happen because we are initializing our DP array with a bunch of zeros. This would never go out of bounds if we're going to the bottom, but going to the right, we might go out of bounds. If C plus one is equal to N, for the last value in our row, we're gonna go out of bounds. So what we can do here is first add an else if because if this doesn't execute, that's when we would wanna do this, but also say if C plus one is equal to N, that means we went out of bounds, or we could say C is equal to N minus one. Either way, that means we went out of bounds. So what we're gonna say is C plus one is less than N. If that's the case, then we're allowed to do this. But if this is not true either, then what we would say is the value to the right is out of bounds, so we're not gonna add it. So the only thing we're gonna do is add the value below to this. Well, not to this, but we'd say the value to the bottom plus zero is what we're gonna put here. But notice how that dp of c is equal to dp, the bottom value, plus the value to the right, which is zero. Notice how this isn't doing anything. This is just like an assignment. It's not doing anything, so we don't need it. But I wanted to explain why we don't need this but I think it's kind of obvious just looking at it. So we don't actually need this else case. It's not doing anything. And then we just have this code, which is pretty much all we need. By the time this is done, the value at the top left position, dp of zero, will have the result. So we can go ahead and return it. Now let's run the code to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.